and welcome to um, this video. This is the AKB Group 2, the Alkaline Earth Metals. My name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and in this video we're basically just going to go through um, the just an overview really of the Group 2 topic. Um, so it's like a revision video effectively. Um, just a, a quick uh, thing to say as well that I'm going to use this PowerPoint that I've made. Um, now if you're um, want a copy of this PowerPoint or if you need um, if you'd like to print it off and use it for revision etc and um, it can be purchased from um, the link in the descriptions box underneath this video so if you just click on the link and you'll be able to get a hold of it there like I say this video is very specific to the specification this is the points from the AQA um, specification so everything on here should be relevant if you are studying the AQA um, syllabus Okay, so let's start with atomic radius. So basically, group two elements form plus two ions when they react. So, um, yeah, so basically, they, they're all group two metals and they always have this configuration that ends in S2. Um, so you might see them here. So you'll see that beryllium ends in S2, magnesium ends in S2, and so does calcium. And basically, when we lose two electrons from these elements, we form the two plus ions as shown here. And these are the electron configurations there. Okay, so the atomic radius as we go down the group increases. Um, so that's pretty important because we're obviously adding extra electron shells here, you can see. So it's getting bigger and bigger as we go down the group. And there's just a graph just to prove that. So extra shells added as we go down the group. Okay, ionization energy. So the first ionization energy decreases as we go down the group. This is because, and here's the graph here, um, this is because we add extra shells uh, as we go down the group, as we'd seen just earlier. Um, and this is this basically leads to shielding, and we're using this word again, shielding. So there's more shielding, hence we get a weaker attraction between the nucleus and the outer electron. So as we go down, obviously down group two, the first ionization energy gets lower because of this shielding. The outer electrons are further from the nucleus, and this weakens the attraction. And basically, both of these um, effects make it easier to remove that electron from the outer shell as we go down the group, less energy is needed. So really important there, using the word shielding uh, and further from the nucleus, um, etc. So bigger atom, etc. as we go down the group. Really important there. Okay, so we it's also important to note, I suppose, that as we go down the group, we do get an increase in the number of protons. Um, however, the shielding effect overrides this increase uh, increased positive charge in the nucleus so um, it's just worth uh, noting that because um, they might ask a question on that but shielding always overrides it okay melting points so melting points generally decrease as we go down the group so you can see here um, the main reason is because we've got this obviously we know that metals are um, they're group two on metals so they have metallic bonding um, and metallic bonding is basically where you have a positive metal ion and delocalized electrons or a negative C of electrons um, now as we go down the group uh, the size of this metal ion increases but the number um, of delocalized electrons remains the same and so does the charge on the metal ion as well that remains the same and basically this means that because the ion gets bigger but the charge and the number of electrons remain the same, then the distance between the delocalized electrons and the nucleus in the positive metal ion uh, gets bigger. And so because that gets bigger, that weakens the attractive force. Uh, and this means it makes it easier to effectively break these bonds uh, and therefore the melting point is lower. And you can see here we've got this general um, decrease um, from beryllium to barium. Now there is this exception, which is magnesium, um, but this is due to some structural um arrangement of magnesium and effectively this just gives it this exception you don't need to know um, much about that really okay reactions with water these are obviously really important um they react with water they form bases now the whole point of this topic this topic is called group two alkaline earth metals and that's because when we react them with water they form alkaline substances so Let's have a look. So these react with water to form metal hydroxide. So here's an example. This is strontium reacting with water to form your hydroxide and hydrogen. Very similar to the reactions of group 1 metals, except group 1 metals are much more reactive than group 2 with water, um, but they still form hydroxide. 
Another thing to point out here is if you look here, strontium's in group two, or all these, obviously all these group two elements, they form hydroxides, but make sure that you have two hydroxides bonded per group two metal atom. Um, make sure it's balanced. Um, that's quite important. Some people just put OH and forget to put the bracket and the two there. So yeah, OH is minus, strontium is two plus, so you need two of them to balance that out. And hydrogen gas is obviously produced as well. Okay, uh, reactivity increases as we go down the group, um, just like with group ones, uh, group one metals. Um, no reaction with beryllium though, um, it's pretty unreactive, so it doesn't react with water. Um, and the reason why is the atom gets larger as we go down the group. The electron's further away from the nucleus as we go down, so that means it's easier to remove that electron, more reactive, more shielding as we go down the group. Um, so that makes the, uh, the metals more reactive. Uh, there's a little bit of an exception though. Magnesium um, reacts slowly with cold water, okay, but it's a lot more lively when you react it with steam, so it's obviously it's a higher temperature. But another weird thing is that actually when we react magnesium with steam, we don't produce a hydroxide, we actually produce an oxide, we produce magnesium oxide. So just watch out for that one there and make sure that if they're talking about magnesium and steam, that you actually produce an oxide and not hydroxide. Okay, solubility. Obviously, this is a quite important because we're talking about how soluble these things are. So group two hydroxides and sulfates have opposite solubility as we go down the group. Okay, so as a general rule, um, if the anion, the negative ion, has a double charge, they become less soluble as we go down the group. In other words, they become more insoluble. So you can see here, magnesium sulfate is very soluble because that's at the top of the group. But as we go down the group to barium, barium sulfate is very, very, well, it's pretty much insoluble. It doesn't really dissolve whatsoever. So um, this basically, because this is a double charged anion, SO4, two minus, it becomes less soluble. If we look at the hydroxide though, generally, um, if it has a single charge like a hydroxide, they become more soluble as we go down the group. And you can see here that magnesium hydroxide is pretty insoluble, but barium hydroxide is very soluble. So as you can see, the solubility decreases. You've got to know about the solubility of these. That's pretty important. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So test for sulfates using these solubilities. This can be really useful. Okay. So we test for sulfates using barium chloride. Okay. So when we're testing for them, we're doing to see if a compound contains sulfur ions. All we do is we do this following method. So we add hydrochloric acid first. Basically what this does is it removes or reacts with any carbonates that may be in there um, that um, could effectively precipitate out when we add the barium chloride. Um, and this would give a false result because we'd see a white precipitate thinking that actually, yeah, we do have a sulfate in there and actually we don't, we just have a carbonate. So we basically remove this to mop up any carbonates left in there. It's naturally found in the water. Once we've done that, then we just add barium chloride. Um, and surprisingly, um, we get a white precipitate. Well, not really, it's a bit of a joke. So effectively, we do, yeah, we do get this white precipitate, but it's no surprise really because uh, the reaction is barium chloride reacting with, let's say, a sulfate, zinc sulfate, forms barium sulfate. Just in the previous slide, Obviously, we've seen that sulfates are insoluble, especially, um, well, barium sulfate, sorry, is insoluble. So we're bound to get this white precipitate. Uh, we get zinc chloride, which is obviously soluble. So we observe this white precipitate if there are sulfates. And this is because um, you form barium sulfate, which is insoluble. The ionic equation is this. So barium, Ba2+, plus, reacting with sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, forms barium sulfate. Notice the state symbols, aqueous, aqueous, solid. Okay, we always form a precipitate. So if we see a white precipitate, barium chloride, add that to your um, compound. If you get a white precipitate, it contains a sulfate. Remember to add the HCl to remove any carbonates. Okay. Neutralization. Now these things are, like we said, um, they can be used as alkalines. Um, so group two compounds, they can be used to neutralize acids. So we looked at the one when we reacted it with water and you formed your group two hydroxides, they're alkaline. So we can use them to neutralize acids. So one example is with acidic soils. Um, so calcium hydroxide, um, which is CaOH, is basically used to neutralize these soils. So we can spray this onto a soil. Some plants prefer to 
um, grow in less acidic soils. So if the soil is reasonably acidic, you spray some calcium hydroxide on and it just neutralizes the acidic soil. Uh, ant acids, this is probably more common. Again, we use magnesium hydroxide for ant acids, MAMGOH2, uh, and this is used to neutralize excess stomach acid that may obviously occur, if, particularly if you've eaten things like chilies. Sometimes some people get um, a bit of excess acid, stomach acid buildup. You take magnesium hydroxide and it should settle that down, neutralizes the acid. Okay, so the ionic equation, dead easy this one for neutralization. H plus, that's produced from the acid. OH minus is from the alkaline. That produces your neutral compound, H2O, which is a liquid. Notice your ions are always aqueous, okay? And your water's liquid. Right, berry meals. So these are pretty useful. Uh, these are used in medicine, actually. So um, the barium sulfate is also known as a barium meal. Uh, barium sulfate is used to help identify problems with the digestive tract in particular. Barium sulfate is pretty dense, actually. It's pretty heavy pretty heavy material so how it works the patient drinks basically a suspension of uh, barium sulfate and what this does this lines the the soft tissues within the body uh, and basically the patient stands in front of an x-ray machine uh, and x-rays are absorbed by barium sulfate you can see an image here um, so you can see that we've got some obviously white um, dense areas this is the barium sulfate inside the digestive tract um, and soft tissues problem is that if we didn't use barium sulfate all the x-rays would go straight through the soft tissue so the barium sulfate basically shows up parts of this now i'm no doctor so i don't really know what's going on here but you could basically um look for things like blockages things which aren't getting through the digestive tract for example so it's pretty um pretty useful for that thing now barium compounds are toxic okay so you've got to be really careful with this yet yeah, we can ingest them which seems a bit daft but Thankfully, as you know from the previous slides, that barium sulfate is insoluble, so it doesn't get absorbed into the blood. So that's that's pretty useful. They ask this question, um, then you need to be able to kind of refer to this, and they might phrase it as toxic, and you might be sitting there thinking, well, ooh, that's, that's quite bad. Why, why would you take it? But just remember your solubility rules. Okay, so we're just applying them solubility rules to a real-life example. Okay, extraction of titanium. Now, titanium is one of these great metals. It's a lightweight metal, but really tough and hard. So, magnesium is used to extract titanium from its ore rutile. Now, magnesium is a group two metal. Um, so, titanium ore is titanium dioxide, TiO2, uh, and it's converted to titanium chloride, titanium four chloride first. All we do with that is we just heat it with carbon and chlorine gas. Now, we've got to heat it with chlorine because what we don't want is the carbon reacting with the titanium because it forms titanium carbide, which is brittle, uh, and that pretty much ruins your, your reaction. So we react it with chlorine. So we form the TiCl4. Then, once we form the TiCl4, we then um, basically pass it to a fractional distillation column. We increase the purity, so we get rid of any other bits that might be in there, like titanium dioxide and carbon, etc. So we just try and get a pure sample. Then... The purified titanium um, titanium chloride, uh, tetrachloride, is reduced. We use magnesium to do this uh, in a 1,000 degree Celsius furnace. We're using really high temperature. But we want to remove the chlorine from, from titanium uh, in this compound to get pure titanium. So we're using magnesium. And here's the reaction. TiCl4, reacting with magnesium, we get pure titanium and magnesium chloride. Okay, so this is why we can use it. So effectively, we're reducing it. So remember, titanium here is plus four. Titanium here is zero because it's an element. So that's reduction. So the magnesium is reducing the titanium chloride. Uh, lightweight, like I say, very strong. Commonly used in planes. You can see the fins of this jet engine. Uh, that basically allows it to um, be uh, used in these kind of uses because obviously you don't want heavy metals in a plane. You want the plane to fly. Um, so yeah okay so that's the type of thing we're looking for for extraction of titanium okay uh, removal of sulfur dioxide so like i say um these things are alkaline so they're really good in terms of reacting with acids okay so a particular use for this is um using calcium carbonate uh, and oxide um so both to remove sulfur dioxide emissions so this is normally produced when you burn things like fossil fuels in power stations etc you produce sulfur dioxide as a byproduct isn't good you don't want that getting into the atmosphere so yeah like i say we can 
uh, produce electricity burning fossil fuels. It produces this harmful pollutant. So what we use, we use something called wet scrubbing. Uh, and this is a method where effectively we um, neutralize the acidic gases coming from the burning of fossil fuels. Uh, it's an acid, it's acid, causes acid rain this if it gets into the atmosphere. So you don't really want it in there. So wet scrubbing, basically what we do is we spray this um, this solution of calcium carbonate or an oxide either or and we spray it onto the uh, sulfur dioxide gas as it leaves the um, chimney uh, and basically what we form is these uh, different substances here so we've got carbonate and oxide I'm just showing both of the reactions here so you dissolve it in water react it with the sulfur dioxide gas and you form calcium um, sulfite which is uh, this stuff which is CaSO3 calcium sulfite notice not sulfate sulfite plus water and carbon dioxide both reactions produce this calcium sulfite so as long as you can uh, react that just be really careful with that product there though and calcium sulfate is really useful um because actually we can sell this so it's great we remove the acidic gases from the flu and we also get a product that we can sell so that's pretty good so uh we use plasterboard so you like board out um interior interiors of houses etc um, and that's obviously used to make plasterboard so pretty useful stuff uh, and that's it that's the end of the um, group two um, uh, revision PowerPoint um, it, as you see as you can see it's obviously just an overview of the whole of the topic it's just pretty useful for things like revision and remember if you want a copy of this PowerPoint just click on the link in the description box uh, and you can get a copy of it there but that's it bye bye